Welcome, Mark. Thank you so much. Good day. Um, I hope I don't all put, put you to sleep after that high energy uh, uh, presentation we just went through. But uh, uh, I'll try to go through as quickly as possible. I, I'm going to talk a little bit about forestry uh, projects here because that's our main expertise in uh, generating carbon credits. But uh, I'll also, near the end, uh, tie into some of the agricultural potential for generating carbon credits and how I see uh, that market going. Uh, but anyway, so uh, as uh, they said in the introduction, um, Microtech, we're Timmins based. Uh, bio we produce biological plant inoculants to increase uh, carbon sequestration. Let's try to get this figured out. Okay. So in this uh, presentation, what I'm going to do is, uh, uh, you know, first off, outline a little bit about our biological uh, inoculant uh, products, our, our main products that we use to generate the carbon offsets. And uh, I'm going to, you know, uh, outline how we isolate, how we collect those, uh, how we screen them, and how we produce them. And then I'll get into a little bit about our current afforestation project in Chile, which is our most advanced carbon project to date. And then I'll talk a little bit about our pilot reforestation projects in Canada, where we're using these technologies. And then I'll get into the current status of some of the agricultural trials that we have done. Uh, and other people, uh, some of them, you know, uh, uh, in the north here in Ontario, and just outline how we could quantify and qualify those to generate carbon offset credits. And then I'll get into a little bit of the current status of the carbon offset markets and how you could sell carbon credits from forestry. So, you know, just uh, everyone probably knows all this, but just the greenhouse effect, what is it? You know, it's going to kind of a new topic that's been on and off for the last 10, 15 years. But, you know, basically we have uh, increased uh, greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. So the uh, CO2 uh, is building in the atmosphere up to 400 ppms through the process of mainly burning fossil fuels. And that's acting as a greenhouse effect where the sun is uh, not bouncing back out into space. It's staying in our atmosphere, increasing the temperatures. Um, probably... Uh, a good thing for agriculture in northern part of Ontario because you get you know, better temperatures. So the whole idea about carbon sequestration and you know the carbon market is to reduce the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. As I mentioned, it's up over 400 ppm's right now, and there's two main uh, ways of doing that. One is you know uh, you know to reduce the amount of carbon emissions going in, burn less uh, you know fossil fuels into the atmosphere. And then the second way is they refer to as carbon sequestration, and that's to uh, you know remove the, the the CO2 carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere, and they do that through enhanced uh, you know plant growth. In our case, we use uh, forestry trees, but you know there's also uh, 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 applications in agriculture reclamation that we could use the uh, carbon sequestration. So, in a nutshell, you know, Canada's greenhouse gas uh, targets, uh, as everyone knows, it's been on and off again for the last 10, 15 years, you know, since the Kyoto Protocol was signed, and we've had numerous greenhouse gas uh, uh, reduction targets, Canada and internationally, and uh, we've never met too many of them. And uh, so this is basically where we are now. So how do I get that to go? Okay, so this is the, the original Kyoto target. Uh, you know, it was uh, supposedly supposed to be before 17 percent reduction uh, based on the year 2015. Now that never happened. You know these are the areas whoops what did I do there? yeah the, uh, you know the, the top graphs the uh, the red, black and blue lines are sort of high low and medium projections of where the greenhouse gases are going you know based on current productions and uh, you know assuming we're on the, the low uh, the low graph you know shooting towards 765 uh, ppms. Um, you know, that's basically where we are now. And our new targets now are the uh, uh, Paris Agreement targets. Can't get it to work again. Anyway, the Paris Agreement of targets is 30% below 2015. So, you know, just wanted to point out here that there's a long way to go to meet any of those targets. So there's lots of, you know, potential for, uh, you know, using offset credits uh, carbon credits in the agricultural market. 
So basically, the main carbon pools I'm going to talk about today, the atmosphere, um, you know, it's you know, basically causing the greenhouse effect, all the CO2 we put up there. Uh, there there's 800 gigatons, that's a billion tons. So that's a lot of carbon in the atmosphere. When you look at the plants, like it's all the terrestrial plants on Earth, there's 550. But the uh, largest amount is in the soil. And that's something that we really haven't addressed now because it's probably the hardest carbon pool uh, to measure and to count, but it's the one that's the most uh, sort of pertinent to agricultural applications. And I'll explain why as we go through here. So soil organic carbon, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because um, in agriculture, that's the main carbon pool is uh, that they count for uh, carbon offsets credits. And that's basically just the soil organic uh, organics that are in the soil itself not the soil organics that are in the plant or the roots in the plant. And the reason that you know, this isn't counted on the agriculture is because like every year you know, or every couple years that uh, uh, the, the, the top plants are taken off and they're, they go off site, uh, you know, they're produced you know, into uh, animal feeds, uh, so they, they, they become an emission. So you can't count that as a carbon offset credit. So in agriculture, they could only count uh, uh, directly soil organic carbon. And uh, that's just something to keep in mind and I'll explain how that's tied into uh, the forestry projects. So, um, so that's sort of just a little bit of an introduction about sort of climate change and what it is and carbon sequestration. So now I'm going to get into just a little bit of the history of Microtech. Uh, as we, I think we mentioned earlier, I mentioned earlier, that we're a private Canadian biotech company established 1990. We've uh, done over $13 million of research and development to, uh, uh, to test uh, our inoculants in the forestry, agriculture sectors, and to uh, obtain CFIA registration. And that's required before you could use a, a biological additive in Canada. So that's a big process, it takes a long time. Uh, we have a fully equipped uh, microbial production and research facility in Timmins. We have a branch office in Santiago where we do some of our carbon projects. And uh, we have registered uh, 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 climate change and offset projects under uh, two methodologies, uh, or two carbon registries rather, the CDM, which is the Clean Development Mechanism, which was under the Kyoto Protocol, and then uh, more recently the VCS, which is the Voluntary Carbon uh, Standard. And those are the two biggest sort of carbon registries in the world right now. Now it's working. Okay, uh, mycorrhizal fungi, that's our, our, our main technology. And, uh, and this is the, sort of the technology we've developed over the last you know, 10, 15 years or so, and, and we've been working on commercializing that. And mycorrhizal fungi, they're naturally occurring, occurring uh, soil organisms that colonize the roots of 90% of all plants. There's a few exceptions, but all trees and most terrestrial plants have a mycorrhizal association which is a fungus in the soil. So what we do is we identify the most be beneficial species for a specific host plant. And, uh, and you know, we look at uh, uh, screening those species and we're looking at the ones that uh, sort of confer the best nutrient uptake for the plant. And uh, with the, the nutrient uptake, it's also taken up the water. So uh, you know, what we want to do is match for water absorption, nutrient uptake, disease resistance, and all that together gives us increased biomass production and the increased biomass production is the carbon that we uh, claim as a carbon credit. So there's, there's a number of different types of mycorrhizae, but the two main types are referred to as, uh, you can see on that uh, graph, whoops, wrong button, can't get the pointer to work, but uh, on the left side of that root, uh, left side yet looking at it, it's the ectomycorrhizae, and that's a, a type of mycorrhizae that uh, it, it enters the root of a plant, uh, the fungi enters the root of the plant, and it goes around the cell structure. And that's why they refer to as ecto, so outside of the cell. And there's an endomycorrhizae that's mostly on broadleaf plants and most agricultural plants. And then that, that mycorrhizae goes right inside the cell structure, and that's where the uh, nutrient interchange takes place inside the cell structure on the endos. And then uh, the photo on the, the opposite side, uh, you know, that's just a uh, colonized root. And you can see the hyphae going out into the soil. Uh, the hyphae, the, 
little hairs go right inside the root structures of the plant. And then you could see there's little uh, round balls on there. Those are the spores. And that's sort of they form in the soil. So what happens is that uh, fungal hyphae that's on the outside of the root, that extends out into the root system, taking up additional moisture and nutrients from the soil, resulting in the increase in growth. So that's sort of the mechanism and the techniques we use to increase plant growth. And uh, this is just sort of a slide quickly. I'll go through how the technology is used in forestry. So one, you know, basically we dig into a, a healthy forest. Uh, we collect the roots that have the fungal hyphae inside that root system. Take that back to the lab. We culture that sort of standard culturing techniques in a nutrient medium. Then uh, number two there is, is, is we screen it. We want to make sure that that mycorrhizae, all the mycorrhizae sort of uh, form an association with different host plants. So we're trying to match that mycorrhizae that we collected from the soil to a specific host plant. And then we basically we have a whole series, all those little numbers there are different species and strains of mycorrhizae. So we grow them in a growth room very carefully, uh, giving them very specific amounts of nutrients. And then we look for the ones that uh, the plants that grow the most, obviously, and then the ones that have the highest nutrient content. And then that indicates to us that that's the, that's the best inoculant for that particular host plant. So once we have that, number three is we culture those using, uh, you know, uh, biotech uh, fermentation. So what we're doing there is we have those, uh, uh, those vessels there. It's going into an autoclave system. And that's a nutrient mix. And then uh, that's the nutrients that we grow the... Uh, uh, the fungal hyphase in. And uh, once we get that, that's the, the main product in those uh, fermentation vessels. There's the hyphae and the spores, uh, which is our inoculant product. We apply that back on the seedlings, the uh, forestry seedlings in the nursery. And uh, then that's planted out in the field uh, with the idea of uh, um, having a, a functioning uh, mycorrhizal system on that seedling. So it's carried out into the field. So, and this is some of the tests we've done, you know, down in, in Chile. And uh, we went down to Chile, uh, you know, in the uh, uh, late 1990s to test out some of these inoculants down there because trees grow faster. We can collect the, 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 uh, the growth data we need much quicker compared to boreal species, which we were working with, just given the growth rates of the trees. And these are two-year-old pine plantations. Like if those were two-year-old pines in, in Canada, they'd be probably six inches tall. but you can see the control, you know, non-inoculated uh, with the uh, selected strain of mycorrhizae compared to the inoculated. You know, the darker green is like more nitrogen in it, and you can see the difference in growth. So we planted, initially we went down there, developed the strains of mycorrhizae, tested them out on a million uh, seedlings on different sites over different areas in Chile, and, uh, you know, proved the increase in, in biomass growth, and then we relate that to the carbon. So that's sort of the cycle of the carbon project. And then this is just a graph, 25 years. It takes 25 years to uh, uh, grow a pine tree down there. You know, that would compare to like 100, 150 years uh, here in Canada. And then we have the bottom uh, line there. That's the uh, uh, non-inoculated seedling. And then that, the top dotted line is the inoculated seedling. That's through the growth cycle. And that section in between the car is the carbon offset. So that's, you know, uh, uh, the amount of carbon held in the, in, in the biomass of that growing tree compared to the non-inoculated tree. So that's how we register and claim our carbon credits in Chile. And this is one of our first projects. We started a number of commercial projects down there. Uh, the first one's in 2003. So that's that same site. Those are a pine planted in a, uh, uh, actually this field here was a, uh, uh, a field uh, of that they grazed the sheep on. So it was, you know, uh, cleared from natural forest probably 50, 100 years ago. And then it's uh, in the foothills of the Andes and the coastal ranges. And they're not productive, they're up and down. So they're not used as agriculture anymore. They're just sort of uh, uh, grazing lands. So those are the areas we planted our you know, pines and eucalyptus. So you could see like four years later, you can see those trees. That's, a, that's that same sort of shot. You can see the mountain in the background. And those are those same trees. So, and this is, uh, you know, doing all our carbon models, growth rates of the trees. This is what we figured out uh, on the eucalyptus. You get 25 tons of CO2 per hectare per year. And in the pine, you get about 30 tons per hectare per year. 
So these are after we've gone through and done all the measurements and followed them for about 20 years. So, um, you know, I know I went through that pretty quick, but I'll go through now sort of the steps of, you know, how to register a carbon project. It's, it's something that's evolved over the last 15, 20 years. There's a number of methodologies, methodologies out there to do it, and they're different for forestry and agriculture, uh, but the general ones are, uh, you have to prove that the, you know, whatever you're doing to increase the carbon in the soil or in, in the trees, it's additional and beyond business as usual. If you're doing it already in the course of business, it's not additional, so you can't claim an offset because you're, you're already doing it. So for instance, forest companies here plant trees. Uh, first they harvest the trees, then they plant them. But when they harvested that trees, that's counted as an emission. Now just because they replanted that forest doesn't mean they can claim that as a carbon sequestration because you have to account both sides of it. So there is an emission when they harvested the trees and then they're just replacing those trees that they already harvested so it wouldn't be additional, so it wouldn't count. You couldn't register a project like that. And uh, another term, uh, then, you, you know, so the two terms are additional or above business as usual. It's another term they use. But the, uh, the carbon also must be permanently stored. Now, and I put permanently in, in brackets because there's all, all kinds of difference in permanently. And when we do a, a forestry projects, so they're not permanently stored theoretically because they're harvested. Uh, or they could burn down or, you know, a disease could hit them. Pine beetles knock down forests in Western Canada all the time. So they're not necessarily permanent, but there's a way to deal with that. But that's one of the things. You, you, if you're storing carbon and taking it out of the atmosphere, you can't just do it for a year and then it's going to pop back in. So it's not permanent. So they wouldn't let that count. And you have to follow an approved methodology under a, a, either a compliant or a voluntary carbon system and I'll explain that later with the differences of compliant and voluntary. Uh, and, there's a, and there's a number of these uh, uh, voluntary uh, carbon registries or carbon registries. Uh, California one is the, in the, VCA, the, the VCR, the Voluntary Carbon Registry. There's big ones in Europe. They do all that. And the you know, Canadian offset system is a carbon registry that's just currently being set up, which is probably the most applicable for any projects in Canada now. Uh, now, in these projects, they must be periodically measured. Uh, like in Chile, because the trees grow fast, we measure them every five years to see how much carbon credits uh, uh, are generated each year. Uh, and then you have to get that validated, all that measurements. They're, they're, they're measured by the proponent. We measured them in Chile. But then you have to get uh, from the registry system, they have independent auditors that come in, check all your numbers, make sure you did everything. Uh, according to the approved methodology. And then once they are validated and verified, say every uh, five years or so, you could register those carbon credits and then they're sold on the market. Now the difference between, I mentioned, you know, the, the, there's quite a uh, the number of rules that are different between the uh, carbon projects for forestry and agriculture. So uh, the main differences in the forestry projects you're allowed to include the, all the above ground carbon because that's there for 50 to 100 years in Canada. If you plant a tree, it's gonna be standing for 50 to 100 years, so they'll call that permanent, although it's not permanent, but that's the definition they use. So you could count all the, the, the carbon in the trunks, the branches, the leaves, the litter, and also the below ground carbon pools, the soil organic carbon, and the roots themselves and also the forest products. When you harvest those trees, uh, a portion of that carbon is held in the tree. It's in the lumber, it's in the paper products. So you could count all those different carbon pools. And then the second point is on the agricultural methodologies, they only allow you to count the soil organic carbon, which puts the agriculture ones at a, like, you know, a disadvantage in my mind. And the reason, reasoning it, it, it is you could only count the SOC, soil organic carbon, for agriculture is the tops aren't considered permanent because they're harvested every year, they're fed to cattle, uh, you know, they come off in one form or another. Uh, so, and even the roots, the, you, you, uh, you till, uh, you know, the sites, uh, you're digging up the roots, those roots break down, they're uh, anaerobic and aerobic uh, sort of breakdown of the roots releases the, the GHG, the greenhouse gases back into the atmosphere. So even the roots, you can't count. 
So you can only account the, 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 the carbon in the soil itself. Uh, you know, so that's sort of the reason, uh, uh, you know, you don't see a lot of agricultural carbon projects, specifically in the soil organic uh, carbon. Those are the direct carbon in the soil. There's other ways of doing it in the agriculture that I'll, that I'll touch on, and those are offsets, uh, like uh, there's someone talking, uh, I think two, two talks before, they were talking about the reduction of uh, nitrate fertilizers uh, uh, in, you know, over the last 20 years or so, I forget the exact numbers, but that in itself is an offset. So if you're doing something that uh, uses less uh, uh, fertilizers, less, you know, uh, uh, commercial fertilizers, that produce a lot of uh, greenhouse gases when they produce them. Uh, you're offsetting those, reducing that amount. That could be a carbon project. It's not a soil organic carbon project, but it's a carbon offset project. You know, and the same uh, if you're you know producing maybe uh, biofuels or something like that. Those biofuels are offsetting a greenhouse gas producing uh, fuel from the oil industry. So there's there's other ways of doing uh, uh, carbon sequestration and carbon offset projects in the agriculture. And uh, yeah, this is just some of our carbon models. And this slide is pretty busy, but I just wanted to put it in. This is the forestry side. And oh, I can get it working now, okay. You can see here, you know, the, the green is the biggest carbon pool here. Now that's the, the above ground carbon uh, in the trees. So that's the biggest pool. And then you can see this is that harvest. It all goes down and then you grow the tree again, you replant. So that's overall the biggest carbon pool there is the tree itself. And you can see that right up here, the tree. And then you go down, uh, there's all kinds of different carbon pools. The soil or gabin, uh, organic carbon pool is down here. And that you know continues, it increases as you go. It uh, jumps up at harvest because there's lots of litter and things that they leave in the bush and that comes up. So then you get more soil organic carbon. So in a for forestry project, uh, you could you know use all the carbon pools, uh, including the brown uh, on the bottom, which is the soil but in an agricultural project, you can only use the soil. So you've got quite a bit less carbon because of that. And uh, these are just some of the, uh, the trials we've done uh, specifically on, on agricultural projects. This particular trial, um, uh, th this was done, uh, I believe uh, this was a soy trial, it's not up there. Uh, but basically what we did, this was done in Kirkton Lake uh, and this was on a, uh, in an old uh, uh, Ministry of Natural Resource uh, forest seedling, and that's just basically sand where they used to grow uh, tree seedlings and that. So what we wanted to do, we knew it was a very, uh, it had no natural spores, uh, ectomycorrhizae spores that would benefit an agricultural crop. No, actually this is an oats trial, I think I said it was soy. This was an oats trial. Uh, so this is just a standard, we put the, uh, the dry spores we produced, mixed it in, uh, with the oat seed and then just applied it to the crop and we got about a 30% increase. Yeah, we got a 33% uh, a increase uh, uh, with the inoculated that's on, uh, uh, on the left and then on the right is the non-inoculated. Now, you know, this was a, a respectable uh, uh, trial. So, you know, if it's going to work like that, it would be really good as a carbon project. But it's not always consistent. And that's the problem with the agricultural uh, sites. Uh, we've done some uh, reclamation trials. That's the top one is a mine site. That's Beecher Lake, Northern, uh, Northern Ontario. And then uh, we did so also some uh, uh, Agriculture Canada research station. That's in Brandon, Manitoba. We did a wheat trial and there was no difference. So uh, we get a big difference on reclamation because there's no natural mycorrhizal spores in the soil. We got a, a, a big uh, difference with the oats, 33%, and I believe it's because there was no natural uh, types of mycorrhizae that would benefit the oats in that field because it was previously used for trees only. So in certain, search, uh, certain circumstances, the mycorrhizae works really good. In other areas, not so much. Uh, this, is, this was a soil trial we did down in Beaverton, down in Southern Ontario, and uh, we used a drone here to take uh, multi-spectral, we're trying to maybe collect better data over the whole field. And uh, this was in a field that was uh, in uh, a canola, which is a, one of the a very few, 10% of the non-mycorrhizal uh, species. So the previous one was in canola, 
and then we figured, well, that would knock down the natural mycorrhizal populations, and then we could inoculate the next crop in the rotation, which was soy, and we got an increase. So uh, we had a 14% increase, uh, you know, uh, by biomass, and the 16, 16% in the in the, uh, um, uh, in the pods. So it works sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. This is another trial, uh, and it was done by Northeastern Ontario Soil and Crop Group out of New Lister, and I think they did a, one trial here in Sudbury and one out in Western Canada. They did oats, soybeans, and potatoes. Uh, this, they did an economic analysis of that, and this is just sort of a, uh, this is a, a published paper they put out, um, and they did an economic uh, analysis of it. And what they found is that, you know, the cost of the inoculum, and you can see the oats is, uh, no, it's not, can't get it working again. Uh, the oats is uh, $11 for the cost of the inoculum uh, per acre, and then the, the increase, although there was an increase, it was only $4 worth. So it wasn't economically feasible to use that inoculum. And, you know, the same with the soybeans and the same with the potatoes. They all had a different cost per acre to inoculate, uh, but in all cases, uh, you know, the, the return was negative. Uh, and this is just looking on a return in a yield in the crop. Now, my idea is to, can we do this type of, of, of trial and increase the soil organic content and claim that soil organic content as a carbon credit, which would make, maybe make this more economical because you could sell the carbon offset. What they did here is they just calculated the increase in, 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 in the bushels per acre times whatever that was worth, and that was the economic analysis. But if we have a, a, a carbon credit that we could tie on top of that, it may be more economical. It may come out on the positive side. So that's uh, one of my ideas, and this is one of the reasons why there's not a lot of uh, agricultural crops out there in carbon projects. And uh, again, yeah, and we also did some weed trials. Uh, we did uh, weed trials 2006 to 18 out in Alberta. This was funded by the government of Alberta. And uh, the first two years, we got no increases. Uh, the last year, you know, we got a, a slight increase, like, uh, you know, uh, on two different fields, east and west, three and a half and, you know, 1.7%. So roughly 2%, which would make it not economic. So much like the ones they did in Northern Ontario, uh, it they just wasn't economical on the wheat. One of the reasons why is on a wheat trial, you have to pay for the inoculant every year, right? Because you're harvesting that crop and you've got to inoculate. Whereas on a, uh, a forestry trial, we inoculate that seedling once and it grows through the whole cycle. So you only have one inoculation cost, whereas in the uh, uh, agricultural fields, you'd have to inoculate each year. So the economics are quite a bit different. But there are things coming that could change that, and I'm not trying to be negative on carbon projects uh, on agriculture. I'm just explaining why they're, uh, they're a little bit more difficult to design. Yeah, and this is just, you know, some of quickly, I'm not sure how I'm doing for time. Got about another couple of minutes. Uh, on the forestry and land use, I, I'm just looking at the uh, uh, sort of the amount, uh, uh, the costs. So from... 2021 to 22 and then 23, like the price per ton, uh, these US dollars are going up, you had $6, $10, $11. So the price is continuously going up. So it, you know, that's good on, on, uh, on the forestry side. But if you look at the agriculture, you know, it's nine, went up a little 11, now it's back down to six. So there's not a, there's not a, a, a although there's more probably uh, projects in agriculture, the amount of carbon they get out of each one is quite a bit less, and then the cost uh, of the carbon credits are less also. And I'm not sure exactly why that is, but you know that's just how the carbon markets are developing. But like I say, they're in a flux, the prices are going up, and uh, all those economic analysis that were done are, you know, could be changing in the near future. Um, you know, this is sort of the compliant carbon prices. I think the previous uh, uh, slide I didn't mention it's on the voluntary carbon market. Now, the difference between the voluntary is, you know, uh, governments, uh, people, industry don't have to offset the greenhouse gases. They're just doing it uh, to have a better green uh, 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 sort of outlook on the environment. Uh, they're trying to, some of it, call it greenwashing. Everyone's trying to, uh, 
claim they're reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. They want to be net zero. So they do that on a voluntary basis. The compliant carbon prices are based on uh, 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 a legislated uh, carbon tax or a carbon offset reduction uh, by a government. In this case, this is the compliant carbon markets. And in those markets, the offsets are worth quite a bit more. And uh, the, the main compliant carbon markets are the EU. It's been going the longest. And it's uh, $80 US uh, for a carbon offset there. Uh, California, 30. Uh, China just started at one nine dollars. Mexico is less. Uh, Colombia, five. Uh, and they have an increase. It goes up by inflation every year till it hits 10. Canada is probably one of the highest uh, carbon taxes that are out there right now. It's currently $65 per ton of CO2, increasing by $15 a ton, uh, you know, going to 170 by 2023. So, you know, uh, that, that's, that's wrong, actually. I just noticed that. It's going to 170 in 2030. That uh, 2023 is not correct. Uh, that's a typo <laughs> that I put in there, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, but by, by 2030, four years, our carbon price is going to be 170. So all those economic models we did are going to change. Am I out of time? Okay. Well, I, I think I'll just leave it there. Uh, I got, uh, maybe I'll, I'll just do this slide and then I'm gone. Okay. The potential for agriculture prod, uh, projects going forward. Uh, you know, things that I think would change the economics, one being the Canadian compliant carbon price. Uh, they're, they're paying a carbon tax of 170 in 2030. Uh, so the offsets uh, would be slightly less than that. So we should be able to get, you know, $100, $150 per ton uh, for an offset in the Canadian compliance system. So that would change the economics quite a bit on these carbon projects. So what we want to do is, you know, breeding uh, things we could do, you know, breeding uh, crops that can adapt to heat and drought, sort of northern varieties. There's a lot of work being done on that. Uh, that could be a carbon project, uh, collecting of northern or site-adapted strains of mycorrhizae that could enhance the SOC, soil organic carbon overproduction. And uh, uh, Dr. Cardardi uh, 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 is, is going to be, <coughs> excuse me, is going to be doing a talk right after this, explaining that a little bit more, how he's identifying strains of uh, mycorrhizae that enhance carbon uh, in the soil. And then production of uh, applications of biochar in agriculture. There's a lot of people doing that. That's a direct dumping of carbon into the, into the soil, which is uh, uh, helping the soil carbon content, which could be a carbon offset projects and producing biofuels, ethanols, things like that is another way of doing it rather than looking at the soil organic. Anyway, I'll leave it at that because I'm over. I always get uh, blamed for talking too long. But uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you so much.